Okay, let's look at uh, some probability kind of questions. Here's a question. What's the probability of getting a face card if you draw one from a deck of cards? Now, you got to remember that there are 52 cards in the deck. 13 of each of four suits. A face card is considered a jack, queen, or king, of which there are four of each of those cards. So the probability of getting a face card is there are 12 face cards out of a total of 52 cards in the deck. So I have a probability there of getting a face card. And if I write using notation, correct notation, we we'll have something like this. The probability of a face card equals 12 over 52. What's the probability of getting a face card if you draw another card from the deck? Well, if I draw from the same deck, remember, I've already drawn a card out. Okay? So the probability, let's assume it was a face card. If the first card was a face card. There is now one less face card along with one less card. So the probability of getting a second face card would be 11 out of 51. And we call this sampling without replacement because I'm not replacing the card back in the deck. If I were doing sampling with replacement, then it would stay 12 out of 52. So you got to be careful with decks of cards in particular because your probabilities will change from card to card. What's the sample space of rolling two die and adding the results? Well, if I roll two die, the sample space is what a list of basically of all the possible outcomes. So the sample space of rolling two die and adding the results, well, I can't get a number one. There's no way of rolling two dice and getting a one, but I can get the numbers two through seven. So my sample space would be the numbers two through seven, and basically a list of all possible outcomes. And that's what we call by sample space. We do a lot of questions with probability involving lists, tree diagrams, area models, and multiplication principle, which we will talk about more as we go on into this unit. So here's a problem. Determine the probability of flipping three coins and getting any two tails. Okay, so how do they answer this with a list, a tree diagram, and an area model? And then you got to make a uh, decision about which one seems to work best. Okay, so I want to flip three coins and get two heads. I'm going to start with a tree diagram. So I'm going to start with a tree diagram and say, okay, the first coin I'm going to flip, I can either get heads or tails. Each of those probabilities is 0.5. Then I'm going to flip the coin again. So in both situations, either I'll get heads or tails. And once again, the probability it will be 0.5. But remember, I'm going to flip three coins. So in every case, this is where tree diagrams become pretty messy because you end up with lots and lots of branches here. So it doesn't work as well in this situation, but still can figure out the answer here. Okay? So 0.5 in every situation. All right. Now, the question was, what was the probability of getting any two heads? Okay, so two heads and one tail, basically. So I'm looking to circle any of the pathways in which there are two heads and, th and one tail. So if you notice, this is one example. If I get one head, two heads and one tail. Um, this is another example here, okay, where I get heads, tails, and then heads. You notice the next one is heads, tails, tails. That doesn't count. Down here I have tails, heads, heads, so two heads and one tail. And the last one would be... Actually, none of them. None of them would have two heads and one tail. So there are three possible outcomes out of a possible eight. There are eight total different pathways of which the probability of getting two heads and one tail would be three out of eight because there are three different pathways out of a total of eight different pathways. These are the pathways that do not give me two heads and one tail. Okay, so that's with a tree diagram. Now let's look at how we would do this with a list. So if I'm making a list, I would and try to be organized in how I make my list. I'm going to write down all the possible outcomes. So the first possible thing is if I were to get three heads. Then I get heads, heads, tails. Then I'm going to look to change the second one and say, well, what if that was tails? What are the different outcomes? I could have heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails. So you see I'm being very organized. Now the next one is to change the first one to tails. Then I could either ha have heads, 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 or tails, heads, tails. 
I left the first one tails, the second one tails, then I could have tails, tails, head, or tails, tails, tails. So again, trying to be organized, finding a different w a way of recording them to making sure I get all the possible outcomes. And then I look for all the ones in which there are two heads and one tail. And it looks like there are, again, probability of getting heads, heads, tails in any order would be 3 out of 8. Okay? So this is a, gives you an idea of how you can use the different formats to actually come up with the probabilities. Okay, the next question seems to be, what's the probability of getting of picking two cards out of a deck of cards and both of them being hearts? Well, remember, there are uh, 13 hearts in a deck of cards. There are four of each suit, so that means there's 13 of each suit. So probability of getting the first heart would be 13 out of 52. But remember, if I get the first heart, then the second heart, there's going to be one less heart, 12 out of, there's one less card in the deck, so it's 13 out of 52 times, this is an example of the multiplication principle. We have two events that rely on one another, depending on the results of the first one. This is the results of the second one. And so I can multiply this, 13 times 12 is 156 out of 52 times 21, 2,652. So this is the probability of drawing two cards out of a deck of cards and getting two, um, two hearts. And that turns out to be approximately 6%. 5.8% is actually it. So it turns out that about 6% of the time I would get the first two cards would be hearts. Okay, so the probability is, the idea is that it's unpredictable in the short run, but in the long run we can make predictions that will stand up over time. The law of large numbers says that if we observe more and more repetitions, the proportion of times will approach a single value. Um, I would write this definition down in, in your composition notebook. The probability of any outcome of a chance always occurs of a chance process is a number between zero, which never occurs, and one, which always occurs. And it describes the proportion of times that outcome would occur in a very long series of events. Okay? So write this definition down in your composition. Randomness, for the most part, is very intuitive. It seems to make sense. However, there's some myths that you do need to be aware of, and that's in the fact that in the short run, you cannot make predictions about random chances. People have um, try to make predictions, whether it be betting on, uh, in Vegas or betting on a sports game, etc., based on some sort of um, pattern that they see there. But the nature of randomness is anything can happen at any time. Um, in the long run, we will tell us probability does tend to, to even out onto a certain value, and that's what makes Las Vegas casinos as big as they ever are, if you've ever seen them, is because in the long run, they are going to come out ahead, even in the short run. They may win, lose money to a certain gambler. In the long run, they're going to win. In the, uh, so basic rules of probability, um, like I mentioned, probability of any event has to be between 0 and 1, all the possible outcomes, if you make a list of all the outcomes and figure out their individual probabilities, it has to total one, otherwise you don't have them all. Um, another formula that I would write down in your composition notebook is that the probability of an event A, and this is the notation, is the number of account outcomes of success over the total number of outcomes in the sample space. So, for example, the probability of getting heads, there are one heads out of a total of two different outcomes, so the probability of getting heads would be one out of two. The probability that an event does not occur is 1 minus the probability, and we use a notation that looks like this, it means the complement of A. So in other words, if I want to know what the probability of getting anything but A, whatever my event A is, it would be all the events minus probability of A. So if I want to know what's the probability of not rolling a 3 on a die, well, there's 1, 3, so the probability of rolling a 3 is 1 out of 6. So that means the probability of not rolling a 3 has to be 5 out of 6 because there are five different ways to not roll a 3. If two events have no outcomes in common, the probability that one or two, uh, uh, one or the other occurs is the sum of their individual accountability, uh, probabilities. If they are what we call independent, then you can just add them. However, uh, two events are mutually exclusive if they have no outcomes in common and can never occur together. And we'll talk about this more later, but if it's not possible to get draw, uh, uh, if you have an event that 
where there's any overlap in them, we call it mutually exclusive. And again, add this definition to your composition notebook. This does show up on some of the AP exam questions that we're going to look at later on. Okay, some basic rules, but using the notation. So, as I mentioned, all probabilities has to be between 0 and 1, and this is how we write it. The probability of the sample space, which is P of S, has to be equal to 1. All the different outcomes and probabilities added up has to be 1. Um, for any event, the complement of A, which is basically um, getting everything but A, is 1 minus whatever the probability of A is. The addition rule, if A and B are disjoint, in other words, there's no overlap, then you can just add the two probabilities. If events are independent, then the, you multiply them. And this is, um, in particular, ha happens with cards. When you take a uh, card out of a deck of cards, you will get a probability now that is different for the next event. So depending on what you get for the first card, your second card will be different. And so in that situation, we didn't, you would multiply. So a quick example, here is uh, some data that was collected on students who take online distance learning kind of courses. And they recorded them by age group. Okay, so the age group, uh, um, all the students, randomly picking a student at random from 18 to 23 all the way up to 40 or over as given on the table. The first question is, this is a legitimate probability model? Well, if it's a legitimate probability model, then it should have all the possible outcomes and it should total one. So we're going to take each of the probabilities, 0 0.57 plus 0 0.17 plus 0 0.14 plus 0 0.12, and we're going to verify that that really does come out to be 1, and sure enough, it does. So this is a legitimate probability model because it does list all possible outcomes. Find the probability that children student is not in the traditional college age group, 18 to 23. Well, the probability of A, in this case, being in the 18 to 23 group, so this is my A, is, as you can see here, 0 0.57. So the probability of not A, so we write that as A complement, would be 1 minus 0 0.57, which is 0 0.43. And so the probability of the other events total up would be 0.43. And you can see that 0.17 plus 0.14 plus 0.12 indeed comes out to be 0.43.